Today we have with us a very special guest, Faris Khan. Faris Khan himself is a longtime athlete. He has changed lives over the past few years. He is a strength and conditioning coach, and he is very much in demand these days. So once you listen to this podcast, you might want to get on his program real quick because he's a very hard person to get <laughs> hold of. So we have Brother Faris Khan with us. And just, just a brief background about him, a fun fact, which I just found recently, is that he, has, he doesn't take pre-workouts. He's had coffee twice, I think, in his life, and he doesn't do coffee. But every single time I've seen him work, he has the energy of, of a beast. So Brother Faris, please, <laughs> please let the audience know that what got you into fitness, what got you into athletic, athleticism, and just tell us a little bit about yourself, how you started. So first of all, man, I really appreciate you guys having me on here. You know, it's a true blessing. And, um, you know, so how I got into fitness, actually, it was in high school. So I was on the track team. And and to be honest with you, I was, I was not fast. I was not very athletic. And, um, you know, it was the conference championships. And all I had to do to let my team win was to not get last in the race. That was it. My coach was like, all you have to do, Fattis, is don't get last. And I was like, all right, cool. You know, there's like seven of us in the race, you know, get sixth place. I'm good. And uh, I remember that race like it was yesterday. You know, I was running 100 meters and, you know, about halfway through I was doing well. And then I slowly started to see everybody pass me. And, you know, after that, you know, after getting last place, I mean, I really had just one job. After that, I was like, you know what? I'm done with that. You know, I don't I don't want to I don't want to feel this again that summer. You know, I kid you not, I was doing whatever I could to get better. You know, I was searching on Google how to get faster, how to jump higher. I was buying books. You know, I was only uh, like 17. I was sneaking into gyms. I was trying to work out, you know, and uh, just doing whatever I could. And then that's how I really just I was like, you know what? I actually really like this. You know, actually, this is something I feel feel good about. You know, I stopped, you know, any other extracurricular activities and just focused on trying to improve myself. And then I liked it so much. That's when I started to study. When I graduated from high school, I went into studying kinesiology. And from there, I just was so obsessed with it. And here I am today. Um, so explain exactly what kinesiology is and the importance of it to someone that might have never heard of it before. Yeah, yeah. I know back uh, a couple of years ago when I when I did graduate, I would tell people kinesiology. They were like, like what, what is that? You know, it's yeah. um, foreign to a couple of people. Nowadays, it is a little more well known. And what it is in, in simple terms, it is the science of human movement. So, uh, and not just movement physically, but also it gets deep in, into the physiological side of it, the psychological side of it, biomechanics of it. And, uh, you know, me, me being somebody who's so in tune with it, you realize that it's with everyday life, everything we do, you know, every time we eat to pick up food to come to our mouth, every time we go down and pray, the body goes through each of these motions. And uh, that's essentially what kinesiology is. And then it can branch deeper into, you know, sports performance, physical therapy, you know, weight loss, you know, uh, so many, so many different branches of it. But in, in general, that's essentially what it is, is the science of human movement. So what would you say that for an average person, why is it very important for them to understand that movement uh, is like basically the foundation of movement is kinesiology? So as you mentioned, like, why is it crucial from our day-to-day -day movements? How do we... Uh, how do we implement the kinesiology and the terms in our day-to-day -day living without having any fitness motive behind it? I think, um, I mean, people, everybody do, does it even if they don't even know it. You know, it's like just to get up from your bed, you have to, um, you know, you're going to actually utilize your abs and to walk every single step we take muscles, the different muscles are contracting and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. You know, every single thing from our day-to-day -day lives, we're doing it. And I think anybody who's conscious will, will, can understand that too a bit, but to get deep into the science behind it, you know, if somebody's not into it, then um, at least if they have an, a little bit of awareness, then they can maybe understand like, oh, you know, that's, that's kind of cool how the human body works and such and yeah. such. And um, it's one thing I do tell to a lot of people is uh, your movement is uh it's, it's literally the the number one well after after our um, you know obviously our, our faith it's such a huge 
huge wealth that we need to take care of. And just when you're a little conscious of things like, you know, you know what, I, I'm sitting so much, you know, let me, let me get up and go, for example, or, um, you know, to look at another aspect of it, what we put into our bodies, you know, all this type of thing is, is one of the biggest wealths that we need to take care of. And um, so I think for somebody who isn't into it, they, uh, they should just try to be a little bit more conscious, you know, and even if they're not into working out, conscious of like, all right, you know, I've been sitting for six hours on Netflix or something, let me, let me come on up, you know, or things like, things like that. And I think uh, that's, that's one of the biggest things we need to look at nowadays, especially during a pandemic. So that's, yeah. Another, just to add on to that ramble, real quick. I hope that answered the question. No, no, of course, of course. But just, uh, just one thing. Uh, I know that there's a lot of myths. I mean, now that you explain kinesiology, there's a lot of myths behind the kinesiology tape. Could you elaborate more like how that relates like injuries and body movements? A lot of athletes have those tapes on when they play their neck, their lower back, their knees. Is it similar to the whole process of kinesiology actually, or is this like a supportive element in it? So, you know, um, it's, it's really funny with the, the tape. Actually, there's, there's been a lot of studies on it. And even now, like, you know, uh, back, back when I was in kinesiology, I graduated now six years ago. But I remember looking at studies about the tape and a lot of, uh, a lot of athletes would find that it was kind of like a placebo effect, like that, you know, they're putting tape on their body and because it's there, the pain feels a little better, but there, there is science behind it. And um, I think, you know, for the general person, if they, you know, just look and they see some tape on somebody's body, that's, that's not a way to just cover up an injury that you may have, you know, when um, like, for example, I had, you know, my brother who doesn't know anything about it, one day he hurt his back, he just kind of taped up his back and I was like, that's, that's not how it works, you know? <laughs> so, um, but there is a science behind exactly how you tape it, you know, uh, which, how, how it's going onto the body, making it, you know, either across the muscle belly or right. the length of the muscle. So there are benefits to it, but at the same time, it goes hand in hand with what are you doing to get that, that injury better? If, if it is, if you are wearing it for an injury. Like, so, it's very interesting you mentioned that because uh, when I, I, I've i recovered from ACL, partial ACL tears, and I've done my um, therapy. And then I took off my brace when I was playing soccer. Soccer's my sport, right? So then, I don't mm -hmm. know, like you say, it might be a placebo effect. Uh, my wife, she helped me like tape up my knee by looking at, at YouTube videos of actually how to do it. You know, so you got to go around there, pull the strap, pull yeah, the, yeah. Pull, pull the extended tape. So it actually works. I mean, uh, at least for me, it did. But then there are also like studies, you said that, you know, it's, it's like for some people, it's a placebo effect. So it's more like get your injury. I would like you would say rehab it, get better. And then for a supportive mm -hmm. element. Yeah, most definitely. You know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's, you know, it's a gimmick. I mean, it, it can definitely help. But you need that combination of everything else you're doing to, to help it get better. Like, you know, obviously with ACL, I mean, you have to go through your, your, your rehab. You don't just put on tape and be like, all right, let me go play soccer again. You know, it's so uh, the combination of everything will help it work. But I feel like that's a lot to do with any aspect in life, but in fitness specifically, you know, when you have a spotter on bench press, sometimes just him having his hands there, you can get a new PR of like, you know, 20, 15, 20 pounds higher than you usually would. It's just like mental and psychological, just as much as it is with these rehab and all that. So I could see the placebo part, the psychological part playing into a big time for sure. Oh, no, no. I'm just saying like it, that, that does play a lot into, uh, into training as well. You know, sometimes oh, it's like, yeah. you know, people who um, like, they love uh, music, you know, like, yo, if I don't have it in, I can't train. Yeah, you know dude. what I mean? Or, who is that? David you know Goggins saying? said listening to music is cheating. I think it was David Goggins uh, or someone saying just that <laughs> mental psychological aspect of that. It gives you an edge. But I was like, I don't know, probably. Yeah, with music, <laughs> I, think one I mean, that's... there's been studies on that, too, on how it, you know, it hypes you up and it can uh, actually build, you know, your mental toughness. So there, there's effects from that. Same thing with, um, you know, caffeine, like you mentioned, uh, Rafi, earlier. I don't I don't take caffeine. But there's been studies that show that it can actually help you become stronger and perform better when taken correctly and in correct dosages. 
So, um, but but now nah, I'm, I'm I'm not cheating. No music, no caffeine. <laughs> let's pause on that real quick now. So, what's your secret? If you don't have caffeine, you don't have pre-workout. I mean, assuming that you take good amount of carbs, how do you? Let's say you you probably knowing you. I'm assuming you might have sometime worked out like six seven a.m. right off the bat. You know, you <laughs> the gym. How do you work with that? Honestly, um, I'm I'm just. I'm always driven for it, you know, like it's um, for, first and foremost, you know, I got I got, you know, the strength from Allah to get it done. But, you know, I'm I'm just always uh, like I'm, I'm always motivated to do it. You know, to me, I never see training like like uh, I got to go work out. You know, I'm always looking at it like, yo, it's time to work out. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm, I'm, I'm ready to get it. So, um, you know, even like, you know, if, if I know that I didn't sleep well, for example, or uh, I didn't eat enough, then um, I might push my training back or, or, you know, I'll just do something that's not going to require me to go maximal effort, for example. But, um, but yeah, you know, I, I just have a good diet, you know, get some good nice rest and just have, uh, I'm always motivated to train. So I think that's the secret there. <laughs> that's pretty impressive. That is pretty impressive. Now, I know we talked about like how kinesiology is like all about movement and stuff. And I think that's where your background and overall an athletic background or athletes, how the train comes into play. Now, why would you say that, of course, you mentioned kinesiology, you mentioned the body movements, but now when it comes to training specifically, why would you say that? And this is my personal belief. That's why I'm asking you is that everyone should train like an athlete. I don't know if you know Max, uh, Max from Stronger by Science, even he preaches this, that yeah uh, yeah yeah I do know. like an athlete so just shed some light on like why does that make a difference in like improving your day-to-day -day performance yeah i mean um well when you look at it it's uh it, it will help you become more functional you know and when you look at athletic movements and then our day-to-day -day movements and uh and a lot of athletic movements we do we actually train the movement itself in order to get better at that movement when it comes to performance Versus if we're just training for bodybuilding, for example, it's like, you know, let me get my bicep bigger, you know, but that movement itself, what are you doing just besides eating with it? You know what I mean? So, um, you know, when you look at it from that aspect and the fact that it can help you function better and perform better, then it would only make sense to be like, all right, let me, let me be able to perform better, even though I don't play sports, or I'm not an athlete, but in my day-to-day -day life. So... Now that brings me to the next point, which is, as you mentioned, now everyone's training like an athlete, right? Now, but also at the same time, everyone has this idea of their ideal body. You know, they look at the magazine covers, fitness models, bodybuilders, even mm -hmm. like, you know, like we have football players who are pretty, pretty big in size, but they're athletic, right? So how mm -hmm. would you say that? Is that something that's like achievable for a normal person? You know, if he decides to train just in an athletic way, you know, explosive movements, power movements, and not like, mm -hmm. like a bodybuilder, would he be, would he or she able to, or would they be able to achieve their ideal body that they're looking for? Yeah. I mean, if your ideal body is um, not, you know, extremely huge, then, uh, then yeah, you'll be able to achieve it. You know, like me personally, I've, I've never been a bodybuilder, you know, I've never uh, even really focused at all on, you know, my aesthetics, you know, um, some I'm not even you know where where I would personally like to be. Some say I'm aesthetic, but you know it is what it is. You are. But anyway, the audience listening, he is. All right. So <laughs> being but humble, no, uh, it's, it's a humble brag, mashallah, but he is. No, nah, <laughs> no, nah, you know, there's long ways to go, but um, but you know, I've never I've never focused on it. You know, I've really focused my training, like I said, since when I got into it from high school on performance, and there, there's no way. If you're training like an athlete, there's absolutely no way, like, unless you're eating, you know, burgers every day and pizza every day, that you're going to look, um, you're not going to look good. You know, you see what I'm saying? So you'll definitely reach your ideal body. But, you know, for some people, they, uh, like you mentioned, they look at these magazine covers. They just want, you know, a huge chest and big exactly. shoulders and whatnot. Exactly. Yeah, they just do it for the, if they do it just for the aesthetics, then, then yeah, you're going to have to tailor it slightly to that. But, um, you know, in my training as well, I do kind of mix in, you know, specific exercises that bodybuilders do do, but then I also incorporate athletic movements. So, you know, it's never, uh, don't just make a body that looks good, make one that can actually perform well too. So. so to sum it up, you would say that it's the work you put in 
and the and your nutrition, of course. Well, ideally, yeah, you exactly. Body. You know, I mean, if you're putting in, aiming for the body, yeah, if you're putting in the work and and you're eating right, then you you're gonna you're gonna look good. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, right. So that. something uh, me and Ruffy were talking about earlier were just the myths behind athletic training versus traditional bodybuilding and training involved in that. What are some differences and myths, I guess, like you from just, a kinesiology like, perspective? Like, yeah, you know, when you're building a bicep, you know, it's just like movement. right. Or the athletic athleticism, you're just like it's like a power movement. You know, you want to make sure that movement and doing something. So, what would you say are like mm-hmm. some primary differences between traditional bodybuilding workouts versus athletic workouts? Yeah, I mean, well, with bodybuilding, um, all, all the main goal with that is, you know, you want to kind of fatigue out that muscle. So, you know, later it's you can you can just build it. You know, you want to if the goal with bodybuilding is to get bigger versus the goal with athletic movements to, is to improve your performance. And so, um, you know, sometimes now and then I might go train with, you know, one of my friends. He is a bodybuilder and we're doing like, you know, five sets of 20 repetitions with like a light weight. And, you know, in my head, I'm just like, man, I, I, I miss the, the quick and explosive things right there. So, um, you know, one of the biggest differences that I can see is the muscle fiber type that's used. And from a kinesiology standpoint, you know, you've got, you know, some of the two main muscle fibers, you got the fast twitch and the slow twitch. So when you're doing that 20 repetitions for the endurance, it's going to build it you know, for the, for the slow twitch, but when you're doing those quick and explosive movements, then it's the fast twitch. And so again, it just kind of goes back to your goal. Like, you know, if your goal is to perform better, then you're going to need to train more like an athlete, but if all you care about is trying to look good, then, um, all right, go ahead and do that. But, um, but also there are similarities, for example, you know, squatting, you know, bodybuilder squat and, uh, also for athletic movements we will squat, but maybe we're just going to switch, the tempo up, you know, we'll play with what is the weight, you know, going to throw in some other things like a contrast, like let's do a, a vertical jump afterwards, you know, ways that you can improve those fast twitch muscle fibers and get more explosive versus a bodybuilder. Let me just fatigue the muscle and do like 20 more reps, for example. Just real quick to, to kind of, I guess, give better examples from my end for fast twitch muscles, would it be like sprinting and plyometric type workouts? rather than bodybuilding you're lifting weights but like you said slow and controlled just for like listeners out there what are some methods for implementing for uh fast twitch muscle fibers yeah so fat fast twitch muscle fibers like you mentioned sprinting jumping plyometrics uh, even lifting heavy weights and then bodybuilding more of the slow and controlled or endurance type thing like going for a long a long run you know, um, or doing, you know, endurance wise, do like 50 pull-ups by that time it's all endurance versus an explosive pull-up where you're clapping above the bar. Well, that's going to be right. some fast twitch. So right now, just kind of, you know, the way you change the movement. Talking about 50 pull-ups, you're at 32 right now. Yeah. <laughs> what, seriously? Yeah, it, was, <laughs> it, it was snowing outside when I tried too. So I was like, maybe I finished a little quickly. So. <laughs> that's really good that's, that was really impressive by the way alhamdulillah so one oh, thing i'm gonna it. ask that like this, i mean this is a very like a might be a little bit of a controversial question but like can bodybuilders have the same mobility agility and can they perform like an athlete like outside of outside of the weights in like general sports or anything yeah i mean if you if they've ne- like they've never trained it before or like just like, they only train say, bodybuilding. Let's say like you're talking about squats, like certain like deadlifts, like certain like explosive movements, right? So of course they might have, they might not have the speed, but they might have the power, mm-hmm. you know. So in that aspect, like for example, football players, and you got football players and you got soccer mm-hmm. players, right? Now football players have some fast players too, but they're bigger than certain soccer players. So in that aspect, yeah. would you say are they able to correlate or like work in different fields? Yeah, I w- I would say so. I mean, uh, if if you take for example, like a football player versus soccer player, they, uh, they, they're both putting in work on the field. They're both putting in work in the gym. But for a football player, American football, they, uh, there's a more of an ideal body weight versus when it comes to soccer. You know, so most of them are a little bit heavier, which means they're going to have to either do a bit more bodybuilding with the athletic movements versus soccer 
they probably focus on, you know, just getting strong in certain in um, certain things to help with, for example, their shot power, you know, and and uh, but overall, I feel like, you know, if somebody is just bodybuilding, they should have the ability to do it as, as long as that's going to require a bit of coordination. They might not be the, the best, but, um, you know, if you build that strength, then you should still be able to put out a bit of work. So. What would you say about like their mobility and agility wise, like in terms of like body posture? Yeah, that's that's the one thing with <laughs> bodybuilding, too, is, uh, you know, anytime you lift weights, then you're, you're going to need to incorporate mobility as well. You know, it's it's um, actually one of uh, my good friends. He he, uh, he he went to high school with me. We're on the same track team. And when he went to college, he went and did track in college. But he was actually faster in high school than he was in college because he started lifting so much and he got so immobile, like in his hips and things like that. And so, uh, yeah, you know, I'm thinking, wow, how you have so much muscle, yet you're slower now. So, um you know, it's it's one thing as well. Like when you're a bodybuilder, you got to do some mobility. But again, if your goal is simply aesthetics, then no one's gonna care if you can touch your back or not. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's that's exactly what came to my mind. A lot of bodybuilders, like people joke with them, they stick like a sticky pa- sticky note right in the center. Of yeah, the- I've seen some of those videos. <laughs> can, like- so now, with athletic training, a lot of times, you know, people. Uh, I mean, not let's forget about training. Talk about general athletes, right? There's always injuries. How is injury prevention? Like, I would assume that it's one of the key factors when it comes to plyometrics, athletic training, or anything of that sort. So how would you say that? How is that? How does that factor in into, like, making sure that you're not injured or you're not injured for long term? Yeah, it's, it's huge. I mean, especially when it comes to training like an athlete, you're doing a lot of high intensity plyometrics, maximal effort exercises. And any anytime you're doing maximal effort or even just sprinting or anything of that matter, you know, it's very important that you take enough rest while you're training, you know, in between your sets and whatnot. And um, obviously your diet is gonna play a big role into it. But um, you know, if if you if you can't line up all of that and you get injured, then you're not even going to be able to have a lasting career in your sport, for example, or you're not even going to be able to move properly. So um, one one thing when it comes to injury prevention, I mean, it's, it's huge. It's, it's everything. And a lot of things um, that I don't talk about so much is is rest, you know, because like, how can I post so much about rest? Because I'm resting, you know what I'm saying? But it's rest, how much sleep you're getting, your hydration, your diet, you know, everything we put into our bodies, it's going to either help us or hurt us. And uh, just being smart about things, you know, it's, it looks like on Instagram, I'm constantly jumping and, you know, I'm going crazy every other day, but in reality, I actually only train like four days a week, you know, in the gym. And then the other days, you know, I'm taking a rest or I'm working on little things that I need to do. And when it comes to those explosive jumps and whatnot, I'm only doing it twice a week. So as long as you're smart with it and knowing you're not destroying your muscles without taking rest, then um, then things are good. But that's when people get injured is when they're just like, you know what, let me just go hard. Or, you know, I don't need to sleep. And exactly. Yeah. I, I used to be like that, you know, back in high school, I was. 1 a.m. doing sprints and just, you know, it was, it was crazy. <laughs> did, you ever, did you ever have an injury, like a serious injury, anytime throughout your fitness? I, I did, yeah. It, it was um, in actually in high school after all that, because I was training seven days a week, I injured uh, my hamstring. Okay. So I was doing a long jump and I actually tore my hamstring. The first, very first jump, it was like the state meet. And, um, you know, I had to rehab for a long time. And that's actually another reason why I, I was so intrigued in the body, because it's like at first I was just so intrigued in the athletic performance. And then after I got injured, it was a whole new thing to me. I was like, man, now I'm, I'm working the muscle, but in a different way. You know, before my goal was performance. Now I'm just like, now it's the rehab. And, and that's when I really, really saw the love of, you know, you know what? I want to be considered a human body engineer, whether your goal is to get out of an injury. Your goal is to sprint faster, lose weight. You know, it's like you go to a mechanic to fix your car. I'm going to come to me, the mechanic, to fix the body. So it's, that's how I started loving it. It's really impressive that, 
you were talking about this, my friend Constant from Canada, he was on with us last a couple of weeks ago. And it's re- even for myself, it's really interesting that how injury frames the way you move forward in fitness and life. You know, it's just mm-hmm. like, it's like, you know, they say that you don't know the value of something until you lose it. But you don't know the value Absolutely. of like, movement unless you actually get injured. So it's, it's, it's a very, very important factor that you just mentioned. And I want to add yeah, on absolutely. to the rest part of it, I think, and diet as well. So for someone training like an athlete and rest being an essential part and then diet, you know, what would that person focus on as in the diet aspect? Would it be like more carbs, uh, you know, less sugars, whatever? What do you, what would you advise people training like, like an athlete? You, you know, for uh, like, it's a good thing. And it just came to mind right now, like how bodybuilders have like, you know, they eat certain carbs certain mm-hmm. protein, certain mm-hmm. fats, and they diet like, you know, they eat this many calories to bulk and then this many calories to like cut and everything. Mm-hmm. How is dieting completely different for an athlete versus a bodybuilder or just a regular person just in the gym? So for, for an athlete, the, the biggest thing that I do is I look at food as fuel. You know, it's every, every, every single thing we put into our bodies, it's going to help you or it's going to hurt you. And what, what I personally do, and this is what I tell people who can help, is when you're making your plate of food, try to have protein the base. And, you know, top protein sources can be, you know, your chicken, your fish, your, your meat, your eggs, you know, whey protein, for example. And then I have a complex carbohydrate because that carbohydrate, that's, that's the main fuel source. That's what the body's going to use to help fuel your workouts. That's going to help you perform and, and whatnot. So... You know, your potatoes, pastas, rice, you know, uh, and then and then the fats, those are also very, very important because not only is it used for hormone regulation, but it's also has the essential vitamins that our body needs. And um, it just it, it's essentially the stabilizer. So, you know, healthy fat sources, avocados, your olive oils, uh, your nut butters, fish. So it's and uh, it, it's in a way it is similar like to, to bodybuilding in a sense that you know we're all gonna have a lot of the same food sources, but like you mentioned with bodybuilding, it's like you know if it fits your macros. I don't. It doesn't matter if yeah, I eat yeah, like burgers, you know, pizza, McDonald's, everything as long as it's in my macros to cut or in my macros to bulk. Yeah, you know, there's for athletes, there's a lot of things you do want to stay away from. You know, the saturated fats and um, like trans fat. You know, things that and the refined sugars, a lot of things like that, it's not going to it's actually going to be detrimental to your performance. And uh, and you'll notice sometimes like if you eat healthy after a while, if you have a, a cheat meal or if you have like pizza for one day, you know, you saw like my post two days ago, I ate a bunch of awesome. pizza and um, I was feeling so sluggish the next day. I was like, yeah. man, this is a tough workout, you know, like. <laughs> It is. So um, that's how it's going to affect you. So mm-hmm. Energy factor does play a huge role because, I mean, again, I can relate to this on so much on similar levels that I try to eat clean for most of the part, you know, when I'm maintaining, when I'm cutting, when I'm, I, I don't bulk, I haven't done bulking yet, but, and then when there are days that I want to like, you know, go all out the night of the night of that I eat that much food, I feel like terrible. I'm like, okay, this was not a good idea. <laughs> Next day when I wake up, my body does not want to move. It's just so lethargic, so lazy. And it's, it's, yeah, that's what happens. It's something as an athlete also, I think it's, it's important because like for bodybuilders, I think it's like you mentioned is like the amount of weight they lift, it's all heavy and they need that kind of food. But for athletes, more about movement. But I think their diet plays a huge role in like how their body feels internally more than the output of the weights. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, if you don't, you don't want to be going into training or if you're, if you're in a, playing a sport, you don't want to go into the game feeling, you know, lethargic and just like, you know, what's, what's in my belly, you know, like, mm-hmm. so that's, that's very important. Uh, just uh, on, on, the, on the topic of diets. So would you say for an athlete, is it like feasible for someone to be on like a low carb or like a keto or like a paleo or any of those kind of like diet that eliminate completely of a macronutrient I, I would never eliminate the macronutrient completely you know there are times when athletes do need to cut you know um, for example certain sports you may have an ideal weight you know like um, 
if you're playing American football, for example, if you're a little bit overweight and you're like a defensive back, you might need to cut a little, you know, things like that. So you can restrict a little bit, but never the the entire carb, never go on like zero carbs because that's, like I said, that's the main energy source and it's going to directly impact your performance. So you would just, So you would not recommend if you're an athlete or you're playing like an athlete or you're playing in any sports, have all the macronutrients, but in a balance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, have all of them. I mean, if your goal is to cut a little bit, then all right, you can restrict. But, um, you know, if you're on zero, like zero carbs as an athlete, I mean, you're just, you're not going to be able to move properly. So yeah, I, I had a keto for a week and that was not my, that was definitely not my way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I was going to, yeah. Just going to shift the topic a little bit, uh, move on from diet. And of course, a lot of people want to hear being home these days uh, with gyms closed and whatnot. You know, what are some, uh, I don't know, uh, an average individual, how could they start working out like an athlete these days without any equipment? I know we heard you do pull ups, but what else? I, think yeah, you might, might, I just have to grab that. my body weight program. Yeah. Oh, okay. Absolutely. That's a good plug. <laughs> Join his body weight program. It's I think ninety five dollars, and it has both body weight and weight. It works. So I think uh, first, what you can do for the audience is break down plyometrics. I think this is where you can, because I think plyometrics a lot of it is body weight. You know, a lot of it is just mm-hmm. without weights. If if I'm uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but please break down plyometrics and how people who don't have access to anything right now, but just their basement mm-hmm. or just space. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah. I mean, you could get the body program, but not. Nah, that's such a joke too. But the um, honestly, yeah, plyometrics. It, uh, it you can mainly use your body weight with it. And uh, for example, though, there there's levels to it. Because if you look at a lot of the plyometrics I do on my page, then people might be like, "Yo, that's way too advanced." You know, that's that's crazy. I can't do all that. But there's, there's a lot of levels to it. And um, that's, that's what I go into, you know, with in my program as well is that like, you know, I kind of start from that beginning. And then after weeks go by, build up the strength, build up the ability to, to do so and get you to a higher level. So, um, play, but plan metrics, what it is essentially is jump training, you know, whether it's with lower body or upper body. It's great for building those fast twitch muscle fibers, improving power, improving explosiveness. So um, even you just jumping up from your chair can be com- considered a plyometric. Mm-hmm. And um, some things that I do at home, you know, actually I'm on uh, when on my Instagram when we first locked down, that's all I was doing. I was in my living room, you know, doing plyometrics, and you know, my wife always like, "Yo, you're making too much noise," you know, whatever. But. Uh, <laughs> I mean, your wife should um, be okay with it. What about the neighbors? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're used to it too. So. <laughs> but, um, and, and tell how to answer your, your, your question as well. You know, some body weight movements that we can do. It's, it's you know, this, this kind of goes back into me knowing how the body works and the kinesiology behind everything. Once you know uh, a movement, for example, like, you know, you know, a push up, you know, the action that's going on with the shoulders and the elbows. And if you really think about it, you know, like, all right, so if I alter a push up in some way, this is now going to target my shoulder more. This is my target, um, you know, my back on the coming down portion, for example. So uh, some exercise you can do, I mean, besides the basics is alter some of the normal movements, for example, a a lunge instead of just a reverse lunge. You can do a forward to a side lunge. You can do a lunge with a jump in between. And a lot of it, what's so good about body weight is you can alter it to your level. And and I think that's where it's uh, it's, it's good for people to even begin with because when you can, you know, grasp that full control of your body weight, then it's just gonna take you even further when it comes to athletic performance. Yeah, with body weight, it's very interesting because even like I've I had a lot of friends who asked me, you know, uh, that, hey, what can I do with no equipment? And I would always tell them, you know, try doing 10 squats, proper form body weight squats. See if you can do that, you know, then build that up to 20, build that up to 30. So you so before you even get into weights, I think your body is like a huge resource, as you said, mentioned, you know, it's a blessing of God. The best thing I was about that we don't look at the body the way we should. 
And I think that in COVID, a lot of people realize that, oh, yeah, we got the body weight push-ups. I can do so much with it if I yeah, feel like yeah. the muscle. So it's, it's a very good point that you made there. Now, a lot of times we have athletes. I mean, I'm pretty sure you work with a lot of athletes, too. You've seen some coaches that work with athletes. What mm-hmm. are some of the workouts or some of the movements that you would say that people should definitely, definitely have in their programming, whether they're an athlete, whether they're just like regular weightlifting and some mm-hmm. movements that you would say they should avoid? Because I know that there are certain there's a lot of myth and research around like certain movements that, oh, you know, like you should do like trap bar deadlift regular than that de- regular deadlift because it takes a lot off mm-hmm. your back, stuff like that. You know, what would you recommend that people should have? What would you recommend they should try to avoid if they can and substitute with something else? So definitely, whether you're an athlete or not, one of the the biggest things I always say is unilateral training. And uh, that's just single-sided work. And for example, if you're an athlete who plays, you know, soccer, for example, most of the exercises and the movements that you're doing on the field are in a unilateral position. For example, sprinting, you know, you're, you're rarely ever doing everything that's, that's bilateral, which is both uh, at, the, at once. And so when you build strength unilaterally, not only is it going to help translate to your sport and performance, but then, like I said, our day-to-day life, you know, as we walk up the stairs, you know, as we, you know, sometimes you got to run uh, from the car to the house because it's cold, you know, that's, it's just going to help your day-to-day movement as well. And uh, things we should avoid, honestly, um, you know, any, anything that is out of your level or just out of your zone, you know, because everybody, there's a purpose in an exercise for, for everyone, you know, like one thing might not be the greatest thing for you, but it could be great for him, for example. And so, you know, if you're, for example, uh, somebody who has some knee pain and you're constantly jumping around on it and it's just making things worse and obviously you're going to have to avoid some of that. And um, same thing, like just kind of dependent on your goals, like if you're a boxer, it's better you do, you know, maybe a dumbbell bench press versus a regular bench press that you work at unilaterally. So it's, it's just kind of coming down to what is, uh, what is my purpose with it? But if you're just talking in general, yeah. I say just be, just be as balanced as you can, you know. So always include some single-sided work, include some double and together work. Make sure you're even with the upper body as much as you push. Make sure you pull. Make sure you push up and pull down. You know, um, just work in every area of your body. That way you don't build any any asymmetries. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think, uh, does that also help with a lot of like regular muscle imbalances, you know, because people go to chiropractors, you know, to get their uh, body fixed up or like, you know, like crack, crack it back or in place or whatever that term is called. Does it also help with muscle imbalance mm-hmm. and unilateral training and the training that you just mentioned? <laughs> An adjustment, yeah. So does it help with the muscle imbalances? Yeah, no, absolutely. It will help with the imbalances. And imbal- imbalances form mainly uh, not just from how you're training. Like, for example, if, if you're training, like doing bench press three times a week, but then you're only doing uh, pulling variation maybe once a week then you will eventually build an imbalance there and uh, another thing that really contributes to building those imbalances is our day-to-day life you know a lot of people sit on the computer a lot and you if you're not being conscious about your form on the computer your shoulders are going to come and hunch forward your hip flexors are going to become tight your core is going to get weak and so that's going to build an imbalance from the front and back and so you know, if that's the case, then you're going to have to actually incorporate those exercises to bring you back up to that normal position. But, you know, in general, if you are conscious about, you know, how you're sitting and how you're spending a lot of your day-to-day activities and you have, you know, a nice balanced workout program, then you should be fine and not get any imbalances. I just, I quickly just focused on my posture as soon as you said how cautious I am. Like, <laughs> like, like, it's, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hard to be conscious about it. You know, even me, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, no, that definitely, definitely, that 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 is definitely something that it's an interesting point that you brought up because muscle imbalance is something that people who've never lifted weights in their life, when they start lifting weights or start moving, 
they feel cramps, you know, they feel a lot of time mm -hmm. muscle injuries. And I think, as you mentioned, focusing on the unilateral movements will definitely, definitely help them. So the audience that is, that is listening, just make sure that before you get into any super excited about starting any fitness program, even I think far as this fitness program, I think you have a whole rundown of like movement, agility and mobility mm -hmm. to get through them. Now, one thing I would, I want you to just share from your personal experience with the audience is, I mean, you know, we just mentioned about unilateral movements and, you know, starting stuff with no equipment, using your body weight. Some of your mm -hmm. favorite workouts from maybe when you started that you've progressed that you do it so much that you're trying to see how you can make it better, how you can make it more challenging for you. So some of your favorite workouts that people can do who are starting from scratch. So if you're a complete, complete beginner, it's um, that's that's where it, it can get a little uh, different for me, because, for example, I was so into it. And what it's funny, actually, because when I did start working out, you know, I didn't have a gym membership. So I was only doing body weight. You know, when I had access to a gym, I would, it would it was rare, but I would I would run to it. You know, I was like, yes, let's get it. But um, I would say, you know, if if you not if you've never worked out and your goal is just to get fit, then you want to start slowly, first and foremost. You know, make sure you do something within your level. Don't ever try to overdo anything. And uh, I would definitely go through each of the main movements of the human body. So let's, let's just to break it down real quick. You know, we push, we pull, you know, we, we squat, we hinge, we crawl, we carry, you know, and uh, there's even more, but just going off of those movements right there, then uh, you can say, all right, push, then we do a pull up, a push up. We pull, let me do a pull up. You know, we squat, let me hit some squats. And um, all of these can be with your own body weight. And then, you know, after you get a little comfortable with that, then you can start to play with variations. Like, all right, instead of a regular squat, let me go do a squat into a jump, for example. And uh, instead of a push up, let me do a, a clap push up. And so as you progress from those basic, basic movements, that's where you can start to increase the intensity a little bit. And how would you say that uh, this, I think, this especially personally for myself, because I've had these issues in the past with just weightlifting, not focusing much on like muscle imbalances or like mobility work. Would you recommend that someone who's a complete beginner start with like balance work or stabilization work or should, or if they're comfortable, if they're like somewhat of an athlete who are just moving, but not like focused, can they just completely just start working out? Yeah. I mean, uh, it's really important one to, to, uh, to it, the stabilization is very important. For example, anybody who comes to me and they haven't worked out in like nine months, for example, they're, they're a beginner, you know, in my eyes, or even six months, you know, they're a beginner. And so I'll start it with things where they will have to stabilize their body more. You know, they're going to they're gonna have to utilize their core a bit more. You know, maybe I'll go into the, the real basics before we get into anything where you're, you're going to have to use so many different muscles at once. So uh, for somebody who's never worked out before, you know, focusing on stabilization and body weight training, then that will definitely take you forward. If you are going to lift weights, then you know, just have some precaution in what it is you're actually doing. And the most important thing though, is the execution of the exercises. So just ensuring that your form is good, that way you're going to instill the good form. And then once you go forward, it's going to actually be good for you and not bad for you. Awesome. awesome. We appreciate you sharing this information with us. Now, just one last thing is a lot. I don't know if you've heard this, but I've heard from a lot of fitness trainers that we push a lot or pull very little. Is that something that you've seen or seen with your clients that we do like most of our movements and most of our work is like so focused on push, push movements that, you know, we don't pull as much so for our body to, you know, be retracted. What, what do you see? What do you see in your clients or like, where do you see that being an issue? Yeah, no, nah, that's, that's definitely true. I mean, especially when, um, when quarantine first hit, you know, people, if they don't have any knowledge of how you can actually train your back with nothing, people were just doing push-ups and whatever, and they just completely yeah. neglect the back. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah, so they just completely neglect the back, and that's how you build the imbalance. And um, it, it's also, you know, you see a lot on Instagram, you know, full body workouts, that's body weight, but 
it'll most of the time it never really includes back and that's something I always pay attention to and um and I, I think yeah it is extremely extremely important especially because you don't want to build imbalances it's uh if you all you do is push so much then you're gonna have those shoulders come forward you're gonna be like donkey kong you know what i'm saying <laughs> gorilla and whatever so you know that's that's where uh you know there's so many ways to do it i mean if you uh if you come and if you look at my instagram from a couple months back when we were quarantined i was doing rows under my table you know i was doing um you know, this ways you travels, you... you're i think you're, you're from egypt correct yeah yeah i was in you egypt travel, yeah. and i've seen you're like you're on the chair doing the single like hops like, what yeah and i was doing actually a back exercise with no equipment it's like Uh, a thumbs up push up for example if you again this comes back to me knowing kinesiology but it depends how you're pushing and it's actually working your back more than the front if you're you know if you're doing it correctly so it's it's just kind of understanding and i feel like if you're not so aware or conscious of it then people will just push and not even know about it i could add on like i think a lot of it has to do with what you see in the media and social media about glamour muscles, kind of what you see, like in the mirror, people don't look at their back, they look at their chest. When they see that, yeah. they're like, oh, I want to work on this more and more and more. And then that's when they, you know, neglect the back and there's imbalances, so for sure. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. I mean, if you if all you wanted to do was look good, biceps, chest, shoulders, yeah. abs, and you're good, you know, that's, that's it. Forget, <laughs> forget the legs and back. The yeah, legs, are so leg, important. legs and yeah. back. Even sometimes forget the abs. If all it is is up here, you know what I mean? <laughs> look good in a shirt that's about it yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. can't perform though yeah so far as i mean again i know you have a busy schedule before i let you go just one thing for our audience what would you say is one of the most common mistakes you see people who are trying to train it like an athlete or trying to either they're a beginner either they're seasoned or they're like semi-pros what is one big mistake that you see and what would you recommend for people to overcome that mistake I think one of the biggest mistakes I see is that people are overdoing it. You know, when, uh, especially if somebody plays a sport, if they're in season and they're trying to train like four days a week while they're doing practice five days a week, and then they got a game at one day a week. And then they realize why, like they're not actually getting better with performance because you're overdoing it, you know? So if, if, uh, if you're somebody who wants to really get into it, then know your limitations and know your level. I know I post a lot of intense stuff on my Instagram, you know, but that's, that's where the level I'm at, you know, I didn't start there. Sure. And, um, you know, I definitely had to, I had to build my way up, but, and that's exactly what it is, is start with your, start at your current level. Don't skip any levels and make sure you don't do too much, you know, really focus on recovery, make sure you get enough sleep, make sure you have a great diet, get enough water, and um, put all those things together and it's going to help your performance. And hey, if you're still lost, Fares has an amazing body weight and weights program, like we mentioned earlier. Appreciate Fares, it. Fares, where can people find you? Where can they reach out to you? Where can they learn from you? So you can find me on Instagram at Brother Fares. It's uh, all one word. And I also have a YouTube channel, Brother Fares. I haven't posted on it in a while, but I actually have a video coming out tomorrow and then from here on out. Inshallah. So yeah, if you guys want to check it out, you know, just want some motivation, that's where you can find me. Awesome, Inshallah. We appreciate you coming on here, Brother Forrest. Thank you so much for your time. I hope the audience, I'm definitely sure the audience learned from this conversation and I hope it was fruitful for you as well being with us. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Nah, thank you guys. Like I said, it's a, a true blessing to be on your, a guest on your guys' podcast and, you know, I hope everybody was able to benefit. I definitely benefited as well, so I really appreciate it. I appreciate it. And assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam.